everyone, and welcome to Careers, Life, and Yale's Must See Yaley Show. The topic for tonight's show is a purpose driven professional path with human rights advocate Stephanie Schmidt, Yale College class of 02. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, Stephanie. Thanks, Savat. It's great to be here. So my name is Yvette Rivers, and I'm Yale College class of 96. I'm on the Yale Alumni Board of Governors. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the Careers Life in Yale subcommittee on the board. And just in case we have some people here who have not been to one of these um, virtual shows, uh, really the purpose of the shows is just to facilitate the sharing of wisdom from alumni to alumni and between alumni and students, it's very casual. And really it's all aimed to help with career and life decisions and transitions uh, we invite you to come back anytime. Um, we're going to be transitioning uh, to primarily a bi-weekly schedule moving forward. Uh, come back anytime, but also feel free to reach out to us if you have any ideas or if you have recommendations for other inspiring Yaleys that we could invite to be on the show. Uh, just a few notes before we get started with our program. You can probably see we are recording the show. The recording will be available on YAA's Vimeo channel if you want to watch it again or if you want to share it with anybody you know. Uh, throughout the program, please stay on mute uh, until we get to the Q&A period. Uh, I also just want to make a quick note to to thank um, our YA staff who always help us so much in getting these shows together and um, and being our Zoom admins. Uh, Steve Bloom and and tonight Kate Gustafson, thank you so much for being here and for helping. Uh, and then finally, I want to do a pitch for Yale's uh, YAA's cross campus. Um, if you haven't already. I strongly encourage you to join YAA's online cross campus. It's an online community, has more than 24,000 Yaleys, including alums and students, and it's just really a fantastic opportunity to network. Um, it's crosscampus.yale.edu, and in the upcoming months, it's actually going to get even better because they've had alumni to student mentorships, which everyone is encouraged to participate in, but we're they're actually working on uh, introducing alumni to alumni mentorships, which I am really excited about. So join Cross Campus uh, at crosscampus.yale.edu. All right. So with that business taken care of, I am just thrilled that Stephanie uh, agreed to join us tonight. Uh, Steph and I, Stephanie and I actually met several years ago when we were both on the board of the Yale Club of Washington, D.C. And, you know, to be honest, ever since I met Stephanie, you know, and I've just observed different things that she's done uh, from afar, I've just been so impressed with how really since her time at Yale, her professional focus has been dedicated to advancing human rights, particularly women's rights. And I've seen how She's encountered a variety of challenges in, in her efforts to advance those rights, and she's just shown tremendous amounts of resilience and perseverance um, in, in her fight. So I'm just thrilled that she is joining us tonight and that she's willing to share a little bit about her journey and, and her insights with us all today. Okay, so how we're going to do this is pretty, for those of you who've been to these shows before, we're going to, it's pretty consistent. We're going to start off and I'm going to talk to Stephanie at first with some, some Q&A. Uh, and then we're just going to open it up for everyone else to join in on the discussion and ask questions. Um, so yeah, so let me just start off by introducing Stephanie a little bit more. Hopefully everyone had a chance to read her bio. I will not be doing that. I mean, she's long and impressive bio, but just some highlights. Stephanie is a senior foreign policy and national security security expert and advisor, attorney, and human rights advocate, advising NGOs, corporations, sovereign governments, candidates, political nominees, and others uh, before all three judicial branches of the federal government. She did graduate from Yale College class of 20, uh, 2002 with a double major in political science and women's and gender studies. She received a JD with a double major uh, um, she was JD from UC Berkeley School of Law. And then she's done a variety of things. Uh, since she graduated, she started a professional career as a federal law clerk. Then she was a litigation attorney in private practice. Seven years, she served as a US Foreign Service officer in Haiti, Brazil, and in DC. Uh, after that, she led the US Foreign Policy Program at the Center for Reproductive Rights. And then she ran for Congress. And although she did not win that race, she had some significant gains that I'm sure she will share more with us about. So welcome, Stephanie. 
Uh, and can we just start off by, can you just start off by sharing a little bit about your time at Yale? Let's go back in time. You know, what was your experience like? And, and maybe just a little bit about how that time at Yale set the stage for your subsequent career and, and life path so far. Well, thanks, Yvette. And it's um, so great to be here with everyone tonight. Um, my time at Yale was uh, for the most magical and special years of my life, really foundational in so many ways to who I am, not just as a, a professional and an advocate, but as a person. I still um, have a lot of close friendships from my time at the university. And um, one of my joys with the alumni community has been growing those friendships in my, uh, with Yellies I didn't know at school, but now do know through my involvement with the Yale Club of DC, uh, with my class, with uh, the Yale Alumni Association. And so I always encourage people to get um, involved. I think my time, I really became who I am in college. I came out of my shell. And um, my friends will all say like, of course, you're like a 30 out of 30 extrovert. But growing up in my house, my sister was like a 60 out of 30 extrovert. And so I wasn't... Um, as talkative and uh, as I am today. And it was really at Yale that I sort of figured out who I was um, academically, the, the roots of the professional, but really truly as, as a human being. Um, and then I really flourished and, and grew. And I think the best part about Yale was just the chance to try so many different things. I was involved in student government. I was involved in the Women's Center. I uh, served on several university communities, including the Sexual Harassment Grievance Board and, and was a freshman um, advisor, a fresh person counselor my senior year. And I also volunteered a lot in the community. I worked um, on a pilot program helping uh, domestic violence survivors in Yale New Haven hospitals. I was uh, really lucky to get involved with Yale Law School in my junior and senior years and took classes there and also worked in their temporary restraining order clinic in the New Haven courts. And so I think that my, my life at Yale was particularly enriched those last two years when I was expanding my wings beyond the immediate campus and getting involved um, in the community. And the, the through line for almost all of those things um, was a real interest in the rights of women and girls and gender diverse people. You know, we were just changing from the women's studies program to women's and gender studies when I was at Yale, and now it's uh, women, gender studies, and sexuality studies, um, kind of taking a very interdisciplinary approach. But um, the law and women's rights and women in politics was sort of always there. Um, although I think it's always good when we admit that we weren't 100% serious all the time. And I also led our intramural sports program for Trumbull and was the captain of the Tang team, which I hear is now defunct um, for all four years. Uh, so, you know, take big chances and big risks. Uh, and I think Yale really encourages you to do that. And it helps you sort of grow and stretch and learn, not just as a scholar, um, but as an individual. And so I think that, that that really grounded me because I had so much fun while doing so many incredible things and learning so much um, about what you know became my career and my life. And so I, I'm just so grateful uh, to Yale University and I feel the, the privilege of having been able to go and have this network um, in my life and know what, what a blessing it is. Um, and that's why I'm really happy to be here tonight. That's awesome, Stephanie. So how did, maybe we have to go back a little bit further. How did this passion for women's rights and and the, and the rights of gender diverse people, how did that really all begin for you? So the summer before my senior year in high school, I actually uh, did this amazing program through a organization, a nonprofit, um, nonpartisan group called Washington Workshops that brought high school kids all over the country to DC for the summer. And you learned about the federal government, the three different branches, got to meet with a lot of cool people. And then a lucky few of us had um, internships on the, um, on the Hill or in the government after that. And I was assigned an internship with 
a New Jersey congressman who was in the uh, district adjacent to mine, and he served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And I attended a ton of briefings on various human rights issues on behalf of the office and sort of wrote up memos for the congressman and senior staff about what was going on. Um, and that is the congressman that I ended up being the Democratic nominee running against some um, <laughs> 25 years later. Um, and I did it in part because I believe that uh, it's critical to have a generational change, that Congress or serving in an elected position should not be someone's lifelong career goal or objective, and that we're sort of strengthened um, when we bring more diverse voices to the table. And I thought somebody who was elected to Congress at the ripe old age of 26, when I was the year I was born in 1980, might have a, a you know, needed to, to go try something else, maybe some mentoring. Um, and so that sort of motivated me to run. But we also, I was exposed to very different views on human rights and foreign policy and women's rights in particular in that office. And it was the first time that I sort of realized, well, not everybody sees these things so clearly um, the same way that I do. And, uh, I, you know, it, I grew up in a household with uh, Republicans and Democrats and independents, and we were always encouraged to talk about issues um, very enthusiastically and listen to other people's voices. And I think those sort of roots, both in early internships and encouraged dialogue um, in my family, and then the example of some really strong women in my family, my mother, uh, my paternal grandmother, um, who left an abusive relationship in 1950 when my dad was just six months old, which was sort of unheard of then and ventured out on her own, um, just really showed me both um, the potential and the landmines that um, a lot of women face um, professionally and personally and sort of coalesced around issues of violence against women, domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and that's been another through line in a lot of my work, both internationally um, and domestically. Thank you, Stephanie. And I think that's a good segue to the next question I have for you. Just, you know, with this passion of yours to help advance the rights of women uh, and gender diverse people, you know, if looking back, I, you know, you've got good solid uh, two decades here. You know, what at what point in your career uh, um, do you, were you most proud of, or, or is there just kind of think back to a time of, because you've obviously, you've done a variety of things and it's all, you've got this common theme of trying to help, the, you know, advance these rights, you know, what time do you look back and sort of on most favorably in terms of your ability to kind of make a difference in that, in that way? You know, I think there are a lot of touch points to that. Like I can look back on every part of my career and be proud of something I did. Um, but the evolution of my career has certainly been progressively more and more to roles that allow direct interaction with the largest number of people. So I loved practicing law. I particularly loved clerking. Um, and the case I'm most proud of there is getting a three judge panel of all older white male judges to reverse an asylum court decision. Um, where an immigration judge had denied a, a woman's claim for political asylum on the basis of um, not finding her credible. And if you look, go back into the record, which a good lawyer always does and read the transcripts, she starts out the tale of her brutal assault by military police um, and persecution by talking about being kicked repeatedly in the head with steel-toed boots. And so the argument I made to the court was that um, the gaps in this woman's story that had led the immigration judge to find her not credible were actually the very source of her credibility because she was concussed and suffering from a severe trauma. And had she been able to recount a linear and clear story throughout, it would have been an indication that she had just memorized a script and wasn't telling the truth. Um, and so like bringing the experience of um, trauma and assault survivors, which I am, um, to the, the foreground and, and helping people who don't have that experience understand what it looks like and how it manifests. Um, but that was also, you know, I, I think I went to law school because I wanted to be a sex crimes prosecutor. But then I realized that I couldn't have the objectivity and distance to see that through as a survivor myself in the way that I thought 
it was necessary to do. And so I really, I pivoted a bit to, to find ways for um, how I could best help women while sort of protecting myself. And then that's sort of what led me to the Foreign Service, I think, and working on more systemic substantive policy issues. Um, and, you know, the State Department doesn't have a career track that's like women's issues or women and girls. It is really um, outside of specific offices incumbent on individual Foreign Service officers to take up that work. And I made it a point of doing that uh, at every embassy uh, or every post I served in, no matter what my writ or mandate was, volunteering to take on extra work or reporting to make sure that those issues were covered in a substantive way. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the things we're starting to see in the U.S. government, a really welcome trend toward unsiloing a lot of this work um, and moving toward uh, an approach of intersectionality and viewing uh, issues holistically and understanding that somebody working in the Economics Bureau is actually dealing with issues that impact women and girls every day um, and needs to be aware of those issues. So I think the, the highlight of my career certainly to this point was running for Congress just because it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, you, you put yourself and your family on display for the entire world to critique um, and question, and they certainly did. And I think you have to really, I don't know how people younger than 38 to 40 do it, because quite honestly, I wouldn't have been prepared for that uh, examination had I not already gone through some, um, some fires and trials earlier in my career and had a real clear sense of self. Um, but now looking, you know, and I didn't, win, as we said, I was the Democratic nominee, but lost to uh, a really entrenched incumbent, despite getting the most votes ever uh, for a Democrat in the district and more votes than a lot of sitting members of Congress. It's really fascinating to look at um, turnout and, and see it's uh, and it was great. Like we had 85 percent turnout. The voices of the voters were heard in that election. And I feel proud about bringing a lot of folks to the table who hadn't been there before. Uh, but the, the, the thing about that is, one, you experience real defeat and profound loss. Um, and two, I am no longer afraid of anything. Like you were like, it's okay. Like if you want to practice for this, I'm like, you that I faced like firing squads, uh, politicians, uh, high school students on the biggest hot button political issues um, of our times. And I think I'm no longer um, worried about uh, doing anything short of skydiving. I have a massive fear of skydiving <laughs> um, still. Plus, I think I don't understand why people want to do something that could result in their death voluntarily. So that's, I think that trajectory has also always informed me risk-taking. Um, I've certainly ended up in situations where a door was closed that I didn't expect to be closed and it took time and effort to find the trap door or the window. Um, it's not easy to move uh, in so many different spheres. Um, it, it takes a little bit of willingness to be uncomfortable, sit in the discomfort with yourself and be okay with that. And I've certainly also been able to do it because I had a family and a support network that was incredibly supportive of me taking all of those risks and knowing um, that I could fall back on that. And the last piece I wanna say about risk and loss, and I think we'll probably talk about this later, is that in my personal life, you know, I was sort of, I lost this election. I was 40 years old. <laughs> I was getting ready to have a good sulk about what to do with my life. Um, and then the universe was like, oh, you think that's loss. And in a year long period, I lost, um, my 37-year-old sister, and my 71-year-old father, who was sort of thrust into a role I never anticipated being the family lawyer, spokesperson, uh, financial planner, all of those things, and sort of navigating my grief while navigating the, all the bureaucracy that comes with um, loss and death in a society that doesn't really allow people the time and space um, to deal with where, real grief. But now, you know, a year, we're now a year past the most recent passing. And I 
I am, I'm not, I don't wish this upon anybody, but I really do feel like um, it's prepared me for anything in life. And I've been forced to sort of reckon with what real loss means. And it's given me, I think for the first time, the perspective that I've needed uh, to push my career to the next level, which is that it is not the entirety of life. There are so many other things that come first. And if you don't put them first, sometimes the universe forces you to put them first. Um, and I, I am grateful uh, to have had the chance to sort of reflect on all of that as I think about what my next steps are, both professionally and personally, and having, I think, a much greater awareness of what, um, not balance, because I don't believe that work-life balance is necessarily achievable and nobody can do everything all at once, um, but continuing to make space for things outside of um, work and profession, even when you're incredibly passionate about it. Um, there's burnout and there's also just a realization that there's so much more to the world. And I think thinking about my time at Yale reminds me of that, right? The best part about being a student is that you have all the time in the world to um, engage in everything your heart desires while um, pursuing your degree. And um, I think that we all need to channel more of that as we move forward in our careers and remember um, what that diversity of experience um, and a fully lived life looks like. Stephanie, I just want to say again that you are such an inspiration to me, and I'm just really thankful that you are here just sharing not just your professional journey, but being so honest with us about the whole picture um, and everything that, that you've dealt with and, and overcome and that you can still show up here with a smiley face, still go to the... Uh, you know, go to Yale events and 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 serve Yale and all that. I'm just I'm just continuously inspired by you. So thank you for everything. Um, but I do have some more questions for you. So, um, you know, you you alluded to some of this, but um, you know, and I we haven't been interacting a lot, but I definitely have known that you have experienced some other significant challenges in terms of you know even professionally, like this with this passion that you have in advancing the rights of of women and gender diverse people. I mean, it is. I'm sure, and you've experienced the uphill battle and how, can you just talk about like what has kept you going? I mean, that's one of the things just like looking afar at your like, you know, last two decades that you didn't, you haven't given up and, and being in fighting this particular battle. I mean, particularly in the last five years, I mean, just, it could, I'm amazed that you, that you, you persevere despite those challenges. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the challenges, you you know, sort of professionally and in that fight that you've experienced and, and then what drives you to keep picking yourself back up and, and continue to fight the fight? Sure. Um, well, I think one of the hardest things for me in my career has been to know when to use my voice and when to let something go or know that I can't fight every fight um, and save some of that reserve. Um, and that's certainly something that um, has evolved and I've grown on you know, over the two decades. So um, I entered law firm land in uh, 2007 and soon we were in the 08, 09 recession. And um, I was looking around watching all these slightly more senior female associate attorneys, most of them single, um, getting fired. And all of the male attorneys, and particularly those who had stay-at-home spouses and kids, were keeping their jobs. And uh, feminist Stephanie, fighter Stephanie, it was like, one, this is illegal. Um, and two, it's wrong. And three, I don't want to be here. I want to be in the foreign service. And so I remember <laughs> talking to my parents, like, that night and the next morning walking into the managing partner's office and quitting uh and you know quitting in a, a flame of glory telling him everything i thought that was wrong about what was going on and i don't regret that um i didn't love having to sleep in my parents guest room for the next six months while i figured things out and realized joining the foreign service was a two-year process not a two-month process um but that you know, that decision is what set me down forward on that path. And I think often people 
are afraid to do the bumpy scary because they don't think they're going to make it through. And I think the through line of my career has always been that you may not make it through in the way you think, and certainly not on the timeline that you think, but you will make it through. Um, and so I think, you know, now I um, probably would have stayed there quietly quitting, um, you know, doing my job and collecting a paycheck while I figured out what was next. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, a realization that you're going to leave because this organization isn't aligned with your principles, but you don't have to harm yourself in the process. And you can figure out the right time and the right way um, to voice your concern. And so one of the things I did at the State Department was I was an equal employment opportunity counselor at every post I went to. And I thought it was really important to take my legal background and training and my understanding of what sexual harassment and, and race-based harassment and um, gender-based harassment, gender identity, and use that knowledge to help employees who didn't have that skill set um, assess whether they should file a claim against uh, the federal government and how they should navigate those issues in their career. And I found that work to be incredibly rewarding. Did it expose me to the underbelly of the fact that there is still rampant misogyny and racism, including at the highest levels of the US government? Yes. Do I still stay up at night, sometimes grinding my teeth and, and thinking about that? Yes. Um, but then I also you know, take a weekend for myself and binge watch Below Deck on Bravo and go for a walk or a hike and call friends and sort of regroup. Um, and then I think the most challenging thing probably professionally was um, stepping full time into the reproductive rights movement, right? There is no harder task, um, I think, um, than pursuing an issue that continues to be politically divisive in this country to an extent that it is not any, almost anywhere else in the world. You know, the massive trend here, particularly in the past 20 years, has been toward liberalization of um, abortion laws globally, including in countries that you would be shocked by. Um, just look at the green wave in Latin and South America, improvements across the African continent, and the US is really an outlier in regression in this area. And so I felt it was really important to do this work, um, including as a Christian, because I think a lot of, um, folks who grew up going to church um, and believe in abortion rights are afraid to talk about how um, their religious or moral values actually inform their support for choice. And I've always thought that that was a missed opportunity. Um, and for me, you know, the reason I'm so pro-choice is not because I, I think abortion is, is a moral good. It's because I know from uh, life experience uh, and living all over the world, that without access to it, um, pregnant persons, women, girls, and, and there are folks who don't identify that way who can become pregnant, um, can't access education, can't access the political sphere, can't work, um, can't leave abusive relationships without access to reliable birth control and um, other reproductive health care services. And it really is the major determinant in any society. Um, uh, on so many issues that are near and dear to my heart. And so you kind of grapple with, okay, I, I went to church and, you know, they say a lot of things are sins, um, but I also know that Jesus said, love one another and thou shalt not judge. And I look at in the faces of women and girls um, here and overseas, and you can't help but feel um, called to do everything you can to help them live full-fledged lives. And I, I know many people can disagree on this subject within my own family. That is the case. Um, but I think the hardest thing for me right now is watching the fall of Roe v. Wade as an attorney, looking at the legal reasoning, looking at the attacks happening in our country and just feeling really hopeless. And then being privy to being an insider in the movement and being concerned about whether um, forward progress is gonna be made because I, I think that the movement, the pro-choice movement was not prepared for this moment. Um, and, and I'm not sure that it, it is even now a year later. 
And so I started to think about ways, what the next fights are. Um, and there's some really interesting things going on there. Are corporations, um, drug companies suing states like West Virginia saying, um, you can't ban uh, medicated abortion pills, access to them. And it's a drug company that has a financial interest. Um, there are all sorts of interesting things that are gonna happen. I know the silver lining of moments of challenge in any social justice movement are that when great adversity hits, um, you often have to figure out new and innovative ways around. And I hope in my lifetime, we will see a better grounding of this issue legally and a fuller conversation um, about what it means to, to value life uh, in all of its forms in, in our country and globally. Um, but it is, it, it's challenging and you have to step away. Um, I, you know, I haven't gone to a march in about a year and a half. I just, I got tired of holding up protest signs and screaming and having people yell at me. And when I was doing that work full time, it, it you know, it can become a seven day a week, 24 hour a day struggle. And whether it's getting off social media and not reading the, the criticism from people who disagree with you or just um, taking a break, I think it's really important, particularly for people involved in social justice struggles that they feel passionately, not just professionally, but personally to give themselves the space and time um, to, to step away, not, not forever. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a movement and it's a team, team sport. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So we're about halfway through our program and, and I'd certainly have more questions for Stephanie, but the, it, we always love it when, when folks feel comfortable just coming on screen and asking uh, questions, getting, having more of a discussion. So please feel free. You, you should see the, the hand option down below. Um, at the bottom scrub, raise your hand, or if you want to put a question in the chat, I can call on you or I can I can read it, but um, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask uh, Stephanie a question about any of her experience or advice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess while we're waiting on people to think about their questions, Stephanie, you know, if you could go back in time in terms of, you know, the, you know, this focus of this particular discussion being on, you know, this, how you have crafted this whole purpose driven um, career path so far and been very consistent in it. But looking back, if you could go back in time, is there anything else that you, you would do differently um, than, than you have? You've mentioned a couple items, but anything else? Uh, um, going way back, uh, I certainly would have taken time between undergrad and law school. I think that would have um, enriched my law school experience. And I also think it's difficult to do seven years of school back to back uh, and bring your best self always there. Um, I I did not study abroad, nor did I take a language when I was at Yale. I placed out of the language requirement with a five on the AP Latin test. And let me tell you, learning foreign languages in your 30s uh, for your job is not fun. It's very infantilizing. And so I'm very grateful for the Foreign Service for learning French and Portuguese. Um, I'm proficient in neither anymore. You really have to keep it up, but it expanded my world so much. And it was a part of this commitment I have to being a lifelong learner. I think when we stop learning and growing, um, we really lose our sense of purpose more broadly in life and, and our reason for being here. And then um, while I don't regret running for office and I highly encourage, <laughs> more folks, younger folks, diverse folks to, to change the voices at the table and start doing it at any level you feel comfortable. I didn't understand um, how it would impact me going forward professionally. And so I will just say, um, I've had job interviews where people really can't get past the fact that they now know I have a D next to my name. Um, and it's funny because they'll ask questions like, well, how can you work with a Republican colleague or a Republican board member? And it's like, well, my entire career, I've worked with lots of different people, Republicans, Democrats, independents. I served in the prior administration for um, over a year and a half. Uh, I served in the Obama administration. And so I think that um, one of the things I hope will start to happen as more people become politically engaged and hopefully the pressure 
um, it feels like we're in such a hyper-partisan environment right now, is that folks will see people holistically and understand that everybody is coming to the table with some sort of identification. And if they don't, they're really sitting from a position of privilege if they can ignore um, how politics in, uh, impacts the everyday lives of so many people. And to not, you know, compartmentalize, and we even do that at Yale, there's such a fear of talking about these things, but everybody's coming to the table with those experiences. And I think we do ourselves a disservice um, by not being more open-minded and also just honest about the fact that we all have an affiliation or a set of beliefs and values, but we can um, bring them to the table or not um, in our professional capacities. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I see that we do have a question in the chat. Uh, Tiffany, would you be willing to share your question with everyone? Oh, yeah, I can. I'm sorry. I didn't know I could speak. Oh, yeah. Uh, go for it. <laughs> OK, um, I just wanted to ask, like, what is your biggest piece of advice for a current Yale student who may want to go into the same field of human rights and more specifically women's rights? Great question. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to give you a list of majors or classes. I think um, one of the through lines in a lot of these talks is that you can major in almost anything at Yale um, and, and go to law school or be successful. So you should follow your, your passions and um, explore, right? Um, take as many different classes as you can, be involved in as many different groups, because I think it's often easier to figure out what you don't like than what you do like, especially early on, and that's really helpful. Um, I, what else? Um, for younger women, I always say a lot of young women in their 20s are like, I don't see any misogyny or sexism you are probably not going to see it early on in your career because everybody's like my law school class was 65% female and you enter a firm or you enter an NGO and it's 50, 50, or there are even more women. It is as you go further along and as women frequently, even in the most progressive marriages, shoulder more and more of the burden at home um, that you start to see uh, those impacts. And, and when positions get fewer, you start to realize that um, the people getting promoted look a lot like the people making the promotion decisions and um, all those people, you know. So I think just to be aware um, and to, to seek mentorship and advice. You know, I've always tried to pull younger women, um, folks of color, LGBTQ folks, those who I haven't seen have traditional mentorship, um, or less opportunities, pull them along with me. But I think with that um, comes an obligation on your side. Um, one of the things I'm seeing with younger people, a lot of interns on my campaign, amazed that they have, that they're willing to reach out to me directly rather than somebody lower in the campaign who supervised them and ask me for a reference. That's amazing. When I write back to you and ask you to write me a paragraph about what you did on my campaign and what you'd like me to highlight in that reference, that's not optional um, because I had 30 interns and I can't know everything that they did. And so many of them are asking for me. And this happens in the workplace too for references and help and mentorship that you need to recognize when somebody is telling you they want to help you, but there are limits to that help. And I literally had somebody respond to me recently, oh, whatever you write is fine. And I'm gonna confess to doing something not particularly nice. I opened that reference application and I wrote so-and-so didn't want to write a paragraph for me about what he did on my campaign. I think you should give this fellowship to someone who's willing to put in the work and effort to get it. Hmm. I'm not recommending him for this. And I think that that's um, something that some folks are learning the hard way but there are a finite number of opportunities and there are so many folks um, competing for them that you really need to be your, comfortable being your best advocate. So do the networking, but write the thank you notes, mm -hmm. make the connection and then keep the connection and always look for ways that you can um, 
help that person out. And it may be very small, but did you know so-and-so? I think you two should connect. All these relationships, even when there's a power differential or you know years of experience differential are two-way streets. And um, I always try to not be the person that's constantly asking friends, colleagues, mentors for something. I try to also um, give and you won't always be in that position. And certainly earlier in your career, you need um, more help than you can give. But I think that developing that sense of awareness um, and, and always saying thank you, I still write handwritten thank you notes. Um, I've always gotten a, a shocked but positive reply to that. Um, something my mom taught me to do. Um, and it's, <laughs> it is, I'll tell you this, Yvette, it was the first opposition piece in my congressional campaign was the release of the thank you note I wrote to the congressman for the internship opportunity in the, <laughs> the mid 90s, published in uh, 2020 in the paper. And the headline was, how can she run against him when she liked him so much then? Um, so <laughs> be careful because you're thinking you're going to come back. But, uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. Um, Stephanie Grilly, I saw your hand raised before. Do you still have a question? Well, I was I was just wondering, I mean, to some degree you you answered the question. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, you know, after your experience, uh, you know. Do you look at, um, you know, what is different about how you look at how this issue uh, can be advanced? Uh, I was going to say solve the problem, but, you know, I don't know that we'll solve the problem in our lifetime. But in asking that question, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of also wondering, um, you know, if there are other strategies that may not even be a part of your purview, you know, um, and also, you know, we, in terms of this group, I know that, you know, in terms of the pandemic and things that have happened, people are looking at, you know, well, how do make, I make my life more meaningful? And um, I'm sure that, you know, the people here assembled are all, you know, for, women and humans rights, but how can we learn from your experience as to how we can incorporate some things to advance human rights in our own, in our own lives? Yeah, um, absolutely. And thank you, Stephanie. I, I have a lot of thoughts. I'll try to distill them. And Tiffany, I realized I did the thing I hate people doing, which is I didn't give you any practical advice specifically on human rights and women's rights. And it is this. Take a look at the LinkedIn's, the resumes of people whose careers you admire and go all the way back to the beginning and sort of make lists of organizations and things they've done that appeal to you and you know, send out those applications. I applied for a hundred clerkships with federal judges. I got six interviews and two job offers. So um, I think it is overwhelming for people, especially early in their career, but you have to just keep trying and opportunities will open up and reach out to alumni. You can you can reach out to Yale and they'll give you my email address. I, I It's okay that, um, and I'm happy to follow up one-on-one -on -one too. Um, so Stephanie, I think a couple of things. Um, some of the great things that we're seeing coming out of the fall of Roe v. Wade are conversations about how it was sort of legally grounded in an area that can be uh, attacked. And I think there's a lot of scholarship coming out right now, especially from those who have worked on racial justice issues and studied the amendments that were coming out uh, in the post-Civil War period um, to um, talk about um, forced slavery and the, the forced pregnancy aspects of slavery um, and uh, the pregnancy aspects of ownership and thinking about other ways that there could be constitutional grounding here. I think there are important conversations happening right now about how um, while abortion access was legal, uh, in reality, it wasn't the lived experience for so many people across this country, either because of financial, um, social, or the state they lived in issues and restrictions there. So really talking about um, 
the reality, the lived reality of people even before Roe fell, um, the popular, the the proselytizing of knowledge about medicated abortion, which did not exist pre-Roe and is really um, revolutionary ways forward. Um, I think we need to encourage more men to speak up um, about this issue and stand in support. I'm tired of being, um, you know, in a room of women uh, or marching with a group of women um, screaming from the top of our lungs about um, the the group of mostly white Christian older men uh, who want to control our bodies and our lives. And I know that that's the majority and the minority of men, the majority of men, the majority of people in this country support choice, uh, support a whole host of human rights issues. And so whatever it is, whether it's the Muslim ban, which, you know, I spoke up about quickly when it happened and signed a dissent cable at the State Department, um, it's being in solidarity with other movements and, uh, and other folks. And I think too often, whether it's the women's movement or LGBTQ rights or racial justice, um, we, we sit silently by if it doesn't directly impact us. And none of us, um, that none of us are okay unless everyone is okay. And sort of finding that solidarity in the intersectional approach, which is something that I learned at Berkeley, um, and from our days back then, you know, I I couldn't be in every single group, but I could attend protests for my friends in the environmental movement and in the indigenous rights movement and show my support um, in those ways. And I think that that is um, something that's starting to happen more frequently um, in communities. And then the last thing I'll say is get involved in politics. There are way too many people, including Yale alums who don't vote. Um, and it's shocking to me. We need to like reintegrate civics and public participation, political participation at all levels um, of our lives. And um, the last thing I'll say is for people who want to get more involved or they just want to donate, I no longer donate to big organizations. Even, <laughs> and if somebody sees this online, the Planned Parenthoods of the world, maybe your local one, but not the national organization. Um, particularly if it's a uh, PAC giving around candidates, because the dirty little secret of the political action committee world is that even if they endorse a candidate, they're not necessarily giving them financial support, which unfortunately in our system is the key to getting elected to office, particularly at the federal level. So I only donate to individual candidates now or organizations that I can direct um, my money or know that it's going uh, to candidates and causes specifically that I'm interested in. Um, you know, politics isn't unique in that way. A lot of charities, you have to look at the fine print about how much money is going to overhead versus actually going to um, direct support. And so I think um, I certainly am looking much more closely at that and supporting local organizations or organizations and candidates and people that I know um, are using that money in, in a helpful manner. So one of the uh, you, you you provided a lot of great insight and points that one thing that kind of I my brain wrapped around was um, you know learning how to fight or you know work for things that don't affect you directly um, and that you know the, the word that I'm hearing more and more these days is how to be an ally. Um, and in fact, that's sort of, you know, it's somewhat different than being the advocate, which, you know, that's full press on. Uh, do you, I mean, to follow up with the questions, do you have anything that you can point to, to people to, you know, uh, learn how to be a good ally? Oh, I'll have to think about that a little bit. I will say um, an experience. So I was campaigning when um, George Floyd was, uh, murdered. And um, I knew that I needed to do something in the community, but I also knew that I wasn't best positioned um, to, to lead in the immediate after um, math with my mouth and my voice and my opinions. I thought it was important for me to play a convening role and a supporting role. And um, I, I, I reached out to folks in the African-American community and my community 
who were involved in different groups around racial justice, around policing, um, and convened an, a series of town halls that my campaign sponsored and that I participated in mostly um, in a, you know, a behind the scenes role, occasionally um, participating in the dialogue. And I think that's what we all need to do is think about what, um, where our, our power lies without usurping somebody else's power or voice. Um, and so for me, I knew it was a convening role in that way that um, I could bring people together, but I wasn't best situated uh, to speak to the lived experience of um, being black in America and interacting with um, the police. And so I, I think that's the key to being an ally, right? First, there's the outrage and the desire to do something. And then um, you need to find out what your strength is and what you can bring to the table in an appropriate way. And the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, a lot of people blow up my phone when big reproductive rights things happen. Dear friends, um, sometimes we ask too much of people who are at the center of things. And it's not my job to explain Roe v. Wade to every person in my contact list. Um, and <laughs> When Roe v. Wade is falling, I probably am not gonna have the time to do that. I mean, if you're a reporter for Time Magazine and you're gonna publish an article, thousands of people, tens of thousands are gonna read, I'm gonna do that. But um, so I just think that the other thing that we all need to do is be self-aware and situationally aware of calling upon um, folks that are deeply embedded in different movements um, and, and making judicious use of our ass of them, particularly at difficult times and understanding, you know, what a, a challenging moment it might be for them. And so I waited to have that George Floyd event for my campaign. You know, it wasn't politically advantageous to wait a few weeks, but the people I wanted to speak were grieving and um, needed the time and space to process and not have another ask made of them or have the opportunity to defer. So I think that's something else I bring to all of this work is trying to recognize the humanity of every person involved in the movement and give people various movements and give people the grace and space um, and support that they they need. Like I'll always remember the friend who dropped off a bottle of wine on my porch the weekend that Roe v. Wade fell because they knew what I needed was um, some liquid solace. Um, <laughs> And so I think anything that we can do, whatever it is, um, to help one another and be kind to one another um, and show our allyship in ways that don't tax the people we are trying to um, align ourselves with is, is best. Such great advice, Stephanie. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Monica, I saw that you patiently held your hand up for so long and then you finally gave up. Monica, you got the last question. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm sorry I joined in uh, much later than I uh, expected. And uh, so I didn't hear a lot of what you said before. And I, of course, <coughs> excuse me, commend you uh, for uh, being such a champion of women's rights and uh, <coughs> human rights in general, right? For many, many years, I used to teach a course on women in the global community at Quinnipiac University and uh, stressing uh, women's rights being human rights, <laughs> those kinds of things. Um, but uh, if I may uh, uh, pivot to a slightly uh, different uh, area, uh, with, the in, uh, with the climate change uh, progressing so fast, we are bound uh, to see many more refugees uh, from the South. Um, and of course, uh, we also see the refugees from all the wars. Uh, so, um, and at the same time, uh, is it not astonishing that essentially all countries are uh, find, trying to find out how best to protect themselves from the refugees? So uh, this is a, a, a policy, <laughs> more or less question, right? But if you could address it um, even you know, slightly <laughs> for the one minute or so, I would appreciate that. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Um, so I go back to intersectionality, right? Climate change is absolutely a women's issue, a children's issue, a gender-based violence issue. You know, one of the biggest organizations to not sign on to the U.S. global gag rule, which basically they forwent uh, U.S. government aid, all public health funding money during the previous administration because they didn't want to be gagged from talking about reproductive rights, is an organization called Water Aid. Why did they refuse to sign on? Because the vast majority of folks they deal with in sub-Saharan Africa are women and girls walking uh, many miles a day to get to clean water sources, and they are often subjected to horrific acts of sexual violence when they venture out of their communities. And Water Aid very bravely stood up and said, we won't abandon those women who are in need of these services simply for trying to get clean water for their communities. Um, if you look at the crisis in Ukraine and its closest neighbor, Poland, um, the vast majority of the, the refugees from this war and displaced persons are women and children because you know the majority of, of men have been called up. They are going to Poland and we are providing extensive aid to Poland, which is one of the most regressive countries when it comes to access to sexual and reproductive health care. Um, we've all heard the stories and I've heard many more from my, my friends and um, in the movement and at UNFPA, for example, about the sexual violence that uh, is being visited upon Ukrainian women and children. And so, um, you know, the U.S. is in a difficult position right now, right, because we need to give money to countries like Poland and Hungary to help stem uh, and, and care for the flood of refugees coming from the Ukraine war, but these are regimes that are backsliding on democracy, particularly when it comes to women's rights, freedom of the press, things like that. And it's a, a tough line. I know my fellow diplomats are walking right now, um, giving funds and advocating with governments who we need, but ideally we would be pressing on human rights concerns. And I think that, right, that is these are the prominent and predominant issues of our day and will continue to be for the rest of my lifetimes. They predict that the refugee crisis from climate change will, will force the most massive um, global migration and lead to the most uh, displaced persons that we've ever seen. And resources will become scarce. And you see it already, communities within our own country fighting over water, fighting over resources. Um, and I think that... Um, the key right now is putting in place systems within our own government, within our agreements internationally that recognize the intersectionality and the integrated linkages between all these issues. Um, and I think that the youngest generations are doing the best job. Like, why are so many young people climate advocates? Because they understand that that is the most pressing issue for almost everything that we care about, whether it's refugee and asylum or women's rights or LGBTQ rights, climate impacts the most vulnerable populations first um, and most severely. And so um, I'm only beginning to, to think about um, how those things impact my career. And I, I go back to sort of um, building bridges with um, communities and movements that are outside and broader than your own, I, I think has the, the best reach. And I think that the biggest changes we need to make in our government and governance structures are unsiloing this work and collaborating across agencies and offices and working closely with civil society, which we do not do enough of, and with uh, business interests um, some of the most innovative things I saw when I was working in Haiti were partnerships between um, Goldman Sachs, the U.S. State Department, and the Thunderbird School of Management at Arizona to train um, small and medium business women business owners um, and then take those trainings back to their communities and become trainers themselves. And programs like that um, are only possible sometimes with the financial support and um, resources that uh, outside uh, corporations can bring uh, to these movements. And so I think um, thinking much more holistically, globally, comprehensively, and um, understanding that we need to build um, 
much more interconnected movements um, to make forward process, uh, progress on these issues is, is what keeps me up at night, but also makes me very hopeful about uh, the younger folks who are coming into leadership right now, because it's, it's something that they don't even question. It's embedded in their, their DNA. And um, that's just wonderful to see because that wasn't the case when I started 20 years ago. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Well, we are at the bottom of the hour. Do you have any final remarks that, that you would like to make sort of in closing? I just want to thank everyone for being here, um, giving of yourself and your time. It's been wonderful to talk. I hope people will connect on LinkedIn, on social media. I'm pretty active there. You won't always like what I say, but uh, <laughs> I, I speak my truth and sometimes it's an inconvenient one for, for folks. Um, and I hope that I'll get to see many of you in a future talk and iteration. And I want to thank Yvette for her time and Kate and Stephen and everybody at the Yale Alumni Association. And just, again, express um, my great joy uh, in being blessed to be a part of this community. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I know you've inspired all of us tonight to, to have a more purpose-driven life. And we wish you the very best and hope to see you again in one of our shows. Thank but thanks so much to everyone else for joining and see you again soon. Remember crosscampus.yale.edu. Have a good night, everyone.